So there are roughly 6.8 billion people in the world today. And I think it's a pretty safe assumption that each and every one of those people has a brain. Uh, I think we can all assume that. Uh, in comparison, there are only about one and a quarter billion computers in use in the world today. Uh, so even if you were to just assume that every person only has one computer, uh, that's still less than 20% of the world that has a computer. The actual number is probably less than 10%. And that's kind of why I like to think of the brain as the ultimate personal computer. Everybody has one. Uh, we know how to use it from the moment we're born. And I think, uh, obviously, there are no robots in the audience today. Uh, we know that human intelligence is still greatly superior to computer intelligence. And I think one of the fundamental reasons why is how the brain and computers store information. Information storage in a computer is a lot like how food is stored in a vending machine. In a vending machine, every, every piece of food has a slot. And the only way you can access that piece of food is by knowing what slot it's in. Uh, so if you want Doritos, for example, you have to know that they're in B2. And you, you plug in B2, and you get your food. And the next one. There we go. OK. Um, so information storage in a computer is very similar. Uh, in a computer, each piece of information is given a slot in memory. And the only way to access that piece of information is by knowing the memory address for that piece of information. And that memory address is completely independent of what the information is uh, or what information is around it. Uh, next slide. Uh, so information storage in the brain is a lot messier. It's a lot like clutter in an attic. So when you're searching through your attic, rarely, if ever, do you know exactly where, a piece of, where something is. But instead, you use information from the past times that you've been there to help guide your search. So if you're looking for your baseball glove, you might not know exactly where it is, but you might remember that it's in a box labeled sports equipment, or it's near the old fan. Uh, and you use your past experiences to help guide your search. And that's exactly how the brain uh, searches for information as well. All the time, we are constantly uh, receiving tons and tons of sensory input. And our brain uses that input to create a context. And it uses that context to help guide our search for information. And that's kind of why uh, if you're having a deep conversation about something, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, you're asked a question about a completely unrelated topic, it usually takes you a second before you can respond, because your brain needs to, to take some time. It actually physically takes time to kind of search for the answer. Uh, so I'm going to try and illustrate this a little bit. Uh, so what goes in this slot? Next slide. So without context, it's really hard to know what's supposed to be in that slot. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit more context and now ask you, what's the 19th letter of the alphabet? Shout it out. <laughs> yeah, it's not very easy, because that's not how our brain stores information. So if this were a computer or a vending machine that we were talking about, uh, we could just plug in A19 into a vending machine and get the answer out. But that's not how our brain works. Uh, so I'm going to make it a bit easier and instead ask you, uh, what letter comes after R? A lot easier. I can make it even easier and give you some more information, uh, some more context. And sure enough, we know that the 19th letter of the alphabet is S. So uh, that's one of the ways that our brain stores information, sequentially. So we know that in the alphabet, one letter comes after another. And we don't know exactly where in the alphabet a letter is, but we know what's nearby to it. Uh, another way the brain stores information is associatively. For instance, uh, you might associate cats and dogs with each other because they're both common household pets. And the last way that our brain stores information is hierarchically. Uh, so an, an example of that would be uh, your baseball glove being in the box labeled sports equipment. And so we're, we're going to kind of go through this hierarchical uh, information storage system and make a little flow chart. So music is a very, very general concept. Uh, there are sub-concepts underneath it. And, and we can go through those sub-concepts uh, until we eventually find uh, the one concept we're trying to figure out. And the really nice thing about how the brain works is once we find that concept we're trying to hone in on, uh, it brings with it a barrage of information. Uh, in this case, if we're talking about an instrument. What does it look like? What does it sound like? How does it feel to play it? And, and once we think about that concept, all that information is immediately brought into our mind. And the reason for that is because the concept is that information. We have no innate sense of what a computer is, for example. But we do know that there's a, a common pattern of sensory input that we receive every time we use uh, this thing that we've decided to arbitrarily call a, a computer. So we have these concepts. We have a concept of the alphabet as well. So now what would happen if instead of, uh, instead of telling you that S came after R, I told you that T did? We obviously know that that's not true. But why? Uh, there's no innate alphabet. 
There's no one true alphabet for everybody. But rather, uh, throughout the years, throughout our lives, we've received tons and tons of sensory input telling us that in our concept of the alphabet, S follows R. But sure enough, if I were to keep telling you over and over again, no, T follows R, T follows R, without anybody there to tell you otherwise, uh, sooner or later, in your concept of the alphabet, T truly would follow R. And this is uh, one of the primary ways that humans actually learn by modifying, continuously modifying these concepts that we have in this internal representation of the world. Um, so the other way that we learn, uh, which we don't really do anymore, it's mainly for babies, is by experiencing completely new concepts. Uh, when we find things that are foreign to us, uh, that sensory input that we receive then, uh, we, we receive the patterns and eventually we build up our concept of an object. Uh, so, and that's ultimately the crux of learning. So one really cool thing about this, uh, so obviously our brain is receiving all the sensory input over and over again, and, and we use it to guide our internal representation of the world to tell us what's going on right now. It's how I know that this is a microphone and I'm in an auditorium. Uh, but another thing it, that's, it does that's really cool is guides our, guides our future. So we're taking in all the sensory input and it's being matched up against things we've, ex ex things we've experienced in the past. And, and we compare it to, to what's gone on and we use that to kind of predict what's going to happen next. And it sounds really far-fetched. Uh, humans can't predict things, but we really do. It's, it's such a ubiquitous thing in our lives that we don't even realize that it's happening anymore. It's how you know that, uh, it's how you finish people's sentences. It, it's how, when you're listening to a song, you know what song lyric's gonna come next. And we don't even think about it. It's, it's such a, a commonplace thing to us. So I was gonna show a little video uh, demonstrating this point, but it wasn't working. Rats. Um, Thank you. <laughs> the video is my closing. <laughs>